Good morning. Good morning. Lovely to see everyone. Uh, we've got a guest with us today. This is Caroline. She is uh, Stennis French. She stayed the night with us last night. Um, she's very happy to see all the Chiefs stuff. She's about the world's biggest Chiefs fan, oh, right. Caroline. So, um, more <laughs> kids. Yes, so you've made a good impression on her. We do have a few announcements this morning. Um, uh, during the month of February, it is traditional for the Abilene Church family to help the Dickinson Food Bank. So there are these back there, correct, Janet? Yeah, you said, yeah. So um, it's the things that they need, uh, their immediate needs, and <coughs> you can also do a monetary donation if you prefer to do that as well. So make sure you pick one of those up, and we'll see if we can show how much a small church could do. Uh, there's also, if you haven't heard, um, Mike Engel did pass away uh, this last week. So we have a sympathy card out there for you to sign for him as well. And one more thing, if you can, before you leave today, there are some membership cards out there to update information um, for us just to have, but also because Dawn gets to do statistical reports, which is so much fun. So um, that just makes his life a lot easier if he has everything in one place. So if you could fill those out before you leave today, it would be helpful. All right, are there any other announcements that I've forgotten or anything? Okay, our call to worship song this morning is Breathe on Me, Breath of God. called to care for one another, and the failure to do so is a violation of God's command. So let us confess the ways that we have failed to care, asking for God's gracious pardon. God, bring to our remembrance the many times and many ways we have neglected to listen to you. We admit that we have been complacent, forgetting to further your ministry by caring for others. We admit that we have chosen our own selfish interests over the interests of others. Forgive us and turn us toward you. The good news is that God's gracious pardon is ours. And when we make that leap to face the uncomfort of admitting when we've been wrong or done wrong, God forgives freely without any ifs, ands, or buts. Amen. Amen. Our, we're going to have another hymn. Um, this is going to be, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee.
turned me down because I forgot to turn it off and was talking to Sina. She's telling me she likes the Breathe on Me Breath of God song. I told her I did too. Um, so to start our scriptures today, we're going to begin with part of Psalm 139 out of our poetry book. Lord, thou hast searched me and hast known my rising up and my lying down. And from afar thy searching eye beholds my thoughts that secret lie. Thou knowest my path and lying down, and all my ways to thee are known. For in my tongue no word can be, but lo, O Lord, tis known to thee. Behind before me thou dost stand, and lay on me thy mighty hand. Such knowledge is for me too strange, tis high beyond my utmost range. O whither shall my footsteps fly, beyond thy spirit's searching eye? To what retreat shall I repair, and find not, and find not thy dread presence there? If I to heaven shall ascend, thy presence there will, will me attend. If in the grave I make my bed, lo, there I find thy presence dread. If on the morning wings I flee, and dwell in utmost parts of sea, even there thy hand shall guide me, and thy right hand shall be my stay. And then we're going to go into the Old Testament, and we are going to read about Samuel. <clears throat> so it's 1 Samuel, let me double check, 3 verses 1 through 10. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call you. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel, so Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son, lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And then in the New Testament in John, we are going to read about Jesus calling part of his disciples, specifically Philip and Nathanael. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found the one whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascend, ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Our deepest fear. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. 
It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrieking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We are born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we're liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. This is a poem written by Marianne Williamson. It's more well known by most people though, because Nelson Mandela quoted it during his inauguration speech. I first heard this poem in a movie called Coach Carter. It's a true story movie, and it stars Samuel L. Jackson as Coach Ken Carter, who made headlines in 1999 for benching his undefeated basketball team at Ridgemont High in high school, Ridgemont High School in California. No one, not teachers, parents, or administrators, seemed to expect more from more than basketball from these boys. No one, that is, but Coach Carter. He benched the kids because they were failing in their classes. He upheld the rule that already stated that you must be eligible. And no one really understood this thinking. And I don't want to give too much away about this inspirational, feel-good sports movie, but suffice to say, the kids eventually see things from Coach Carter's point of view. One of the most obstinate young men recites part of this poem to signify his eventual understanding. That scene affected me so much, the words, the delivery, that I wanted to find out more about them, and that's where I found the whole poem, and it's something that I post on a regular basis on social media. It is by far one of my favorite poems. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talent, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. In many ways, Samuel was a true child of God. If you don't remember from earlier in his story, his mother Hannah was unable to have children. Meanwhile, her husband's other wife was having many children. And it was really hard for her. And so she went to the temple and she poured her heart and soul out in prayer to God. So much so that Eli thought that she had come to the temple drunk. God answered the prayer of Samuel's mother. Hannah's heartfelt, passionate prayers for a child. And out of gratitude, she dedicated her long-awaited son to a life of service in the temple. We don't know how young Samuel was when he joined Eli. I tried to find the idea of it, and it's anywhere from him being weaned to him being able to use the restroom by himself to being of teachable age. So he was young, at the most probably eight, We also don't know if Samuel had any idea of just how special he was. Did his mother tell him the story of her praying on her knees in the temple, of the priest Eli finding her? Did she whisper the joy she felt when she discovered she was going to be able to have him after years of waiting as a bedtime story? Did she sing her song of gratitude from chapter 2 as she held him tight? Samuel was young enough that he did not know what the voice of God was. God had to call him three times before Eli got a clue and told Samuel what to say. If Samuel did not know that God had special plans for him, he was going to find out really quickly. 
When you continue in in that chapter, one of the first things he has to do a prophecy about is the destruction of Eli's sons. Samuel's call story is one that most people know because it's kind of a, a big one. But we get another call story in John during our gospel. Philip and Nathaniel are not ones that we hear a lot about. We know there are 12 disciples. I wager a guess that most of us can't say all of them without looking it up. I know I can't. And Nathaniel is one that is not that we don't see anywhere else really except for the book of John. So Jesus called Philip first. And Philip went to Nathaniel about this amazing prophet he started following. And Nathaniel is cynical, as most of us probably would be. So there's an internet meme called the Florida Man. And I don't know if you've ever seen it or heard of it, but the phrase Florida Man is taken from various unrelated news articles which describe people who live in Florida and do, frankly, stupid acts of uh, breaking the law. And they're funny. And the joke came from the fact that it seemed like whenever you saw these ridiculous stories of crimes committed, they took place in Florida and began with, a Florida man found, a Florida man did. And it's become a running joke. Internet users will typically submit links to these news stories and articles so that other people can see it, and that's how it's kind of exploded. And these stories call attention to Florida's supposed notor uh, notoriety for strange and unusual events. Of course, Florida most likely doesn't have more strange people than any of the rest of our states, but according to the Miami News Time, New Times, Florida has really open freedom of information, law, uh, information laws. So it's really easy for journalists to obtain information about all the arrests that happen in the state. And that probably is the reason why we see more about them. A CNN, a CNN article um, on this meme also suggests that the breadth of reports of bizarre activities is due to a lot of different factors. Public record laws, like we said, a relatively high and diverse population of the state. There's just about everything you can think of when you look at Florida. And also, sadly, there's a real lack of mental health fund funding there. So this meme originated in 2013. And like I said, so some examples of the headlines are Florida man run over by van after dog pushes accelerator. Or police arrest Florida man for drunken joyride on motorized scooter at Walmart. So let's say you knew all this before I told you, or now that you know these things, and you understand that the Florida man is a myth that gets used. Imagine if a friend came up to you and said, I met the Florida man. He is a wise and inspirational speaker. You would probably be just as skeptical because that is how most Israelites thought of, I just forgot what I was talking about, Nazareth, sorry, where Jesus was raised. Nazareth was kind of nothing, it wasn't that big of a deal. It was a small town, people kind of made fun of it. Why would anything good come from Nazareth? Philip does something that I think a lot of us probably have a hard time with. He doesn't try to convince Nathaniel. He doesn't stand there and argue with him or tell him all the things. He just says, come and see for yourself. He trusts that Jesus will change Nathaniel's mind on his own. And Jesus does not disappoint. He calls Nathaniel an honest man, which can very easily be heard just as empty flattery. So Nathaniel's still doubtful. But Jesus proves his abilities by telling him where he was sitting when Philip came to him. And this Nathaniel's duly impressed with, for there was no way for him to have seen him. And Jesus' reply to that is, Oh friend, just you wait. Nathaniel was not able to see Jesus for who he was until it was proven. But Jesus did not need to speak with Nathanael, nor travel with him 
to know his heart. Jesus saw something in him. Jesus saw something in all the people that he called to travel with him. Jesus knew what those disciples would be capable of, especially once they were infused with the Holy Spirit. Thankfully, we don't need God to speak directly to us for us to realize we are special to God, that as children of God, there is a plan for all of us. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. Psalm 139 speaks of how thoroughly God knows us. If God calls us to something, it's because God is well aware of what we are capable of. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. That's a terrifying thought. It's supposed to be comforting, but for me, that's a little scary. Because I am well aware of what my faults and sins are. I really don't feel confident in God's um, confidence. I don't feel worthy of God's confidence in me. I just turned in my final, finally, the last part of it, last Thursday, that I have been working on the process, some good reason and some putting off because I was scared, for about 10 years now. Something Josh hears me say on several occasions is that God believes in me far more than I believe in myself. And usually this is said when I'm at my wit's end or I just don't think I can do it. I, like most people probably, struggle with the difference between confidence and humility. Your playing small does not serve the world. Paul speaks of humility frequently in the Bible. He admonishes those reading his letters to lay aside their own desires, to put others ahead of themselves. However, he also says that if you're going to boast, boast in what God is doing through you. Believing in oneself, of what we are capable of through the Holy Spirit and in God's call, that is not being prideful. It's worshiping God in the world. As we let our light, our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. Jesus tells us that we are the light of the world and commands us to let our light shine before others so they can see our love, so they can see God's love for others in our actions and then give glory to God. We do not need to brag about our piety or our devoutness or how good we are at reading our Bible every day. Our actions will speak for themselves. We have been blessed to be a blessing. Jesus said everyone will know us, will know that we are his followers by our love. Perfect love casts out fear. As we're liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. The ability we have in being children of God is powerful. We talked about that a little bit last week too. And it's true. It's something we need to be reminded because when the world seems big and scary, we feel small and insignificant. And when we do feel like we have some confidence to speak out, often it's with words that don't convey love because we're frustrated and we're tired. The love that we're capable of in Jesus Christ's example and sacrifice is powerful. The abilities we possess through the Holy Spirit, they are powerful. And it's frightening. Our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate, that, but that we are powerful beyond measure because that means that we can climb to amazing heights, but it also means we can far, fall just as far. And the thing is, God already knows. 
God knows our every strength, and God also knows our every weakness and believes in us anyway. We have a call from God, and that doesn't always mean ordained ministry. To assume that the only people who have a call from God is to preach and teach is far too narrow a view of God's power. The call extends to our every day. In fact, we reach far more people that way. Our call is to shine our light in each and every task we undertake, whether that is housework or our secular jobs or our volunteering, or even just the way we treat the stranger in the store when it's crowded and we want to get home. There's a story about a monk named Brother Lawrence, and he had been given the very non-spiritual task of washing dishes and peeling potatoes. He stayed so busy in the kitchen that he often met the, missed those set times of community prayers and worship. My brother Lawrence very easily could have been frustrated with this, wondered why they couldn't just rotate so that he didn't have to be there all the time. But instead, Brother Lawrence decided to see his everyday boring tasks as opportunities to worship God. In those quiet moments of washing the dishes, he could talk to God and listen to God. In the monotony of peeling potatoes, he could say his prayers. God does not call us to anything small. For if God calls us to it, it matters. We matter. We are children of the Most High God who has searched us and planned our path. We are brilliant, we are talented, we are fabulous. Because of God's immense love for us, we can love others and inspire them to embrace God's love for us and discover their own brilliance. We can help them step out of their fear and then go on to inspire others. We do these things in God's name, with God's blessing. Glory be to God. Amen. Amen. Now we'll have our special music.
go into this next journey. If any of you are, are friends with Christy on Facebook, she has really appreciated all the prayers and people reaching out to her, and she feels um, as much heartache as she has, she does feel like God is with her, and, and that we know will give her a lot of comfort. So we want to keep praying that she'll continue to have that. And also their children and grandchildren. It's a big change. I uh, also have word that Lynette is in quarantine, so that's why we don't have her with us today. So be praying for her, and of course keep praying for her in that way so that she can get healed up and feeling better. Is there any others that I need to, that we want to pray for, we want to lift up? Okay, well then, will you join me in a time of prayer? Compassionate God, we bring to you our concerns. Our concerns for our troubled world. May the nation seek peace. We pray for victims, those who are killed or wounded, those who mourn them, and those who live in fear. We pray for those who labor, and we pray for those who have no work. We pray for the concerns that are closer <coughs> to our hearts and our homes. We pray for Lynette, for her continued healing. We lift up to you the family of Mike Engel. Remind them of how big and how strong your love is. Give them comfort as they enter into this next phase of life. Show us, inspire us, teach us how to be your hands and feet so that we can bring peace to our world, in our corner of the world or in the world at large. With different gifts, with a variety of talents, with an array of interest, we come to worship you, our creating God. We are here to unite our spirits, to be made one in Jesus Christ, to be merged in hope as your children. Bless our differences, that the unique gifts and perceptions of each may strengthen our oneness, so that your church may continue to do good in the world, to glorify you, and to show others your glory. We pray all these things in your Son's name who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I think that I need to have that written down up here sometimes. Our closing song is, uh, Open My Eyes That I May See.
as we exit this place and we go our separate ways for the week, I implore you to remember just how powerful we truly are in God's name and share that with others. Inspire them and help them see just how powerful they can be. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Thank you.